But it's really like because it has this propositional part in it, so it's kind of useful to use a lot of yeah. Okay. Yeah. Morning, I'm Vladimir Kuchera. I'm going to present the results of the research platforms, also of the testbed and of the RECAI project. Uh, the members of the platform departments are the colleagues Babushka, myself, Svitek, Shivitz, and Urban. Uh, Babushka, Shivitz, and Urban have already presented or will present the results elsewhere. So it remains uh, Professor Svitek and myself. Uh, we have uh, several uh, results listed in our publication system. And out of the, the results, we have decided to uh, present the result by uh, Virasov Svitek, which is uh, shown here in yellow color. So, Mirosov, would you please come down? Oh. Thank you. Uh, dear colleagues, I have prepared for today's presentation uh, the content of the paper. Yeah, this one. It's working. Emergent intelligence in uh, generalized poor quantum uh, systems. In classical informatics, we work with uh, bits uh, zero and one. And in quantum informatics, it is the, it is, <coughs> uh, we work with uh, qubits that define uh, both uh, zero and one uh, weighted by complex value when a modulus uh, square means the probability of falling zero or one. Uh, so quantum informatics has uh, a lot of features like uh, very known entanglement. If we take uh, two quantum bits together, so it is it yields into quantum superposition and also to quantum a re register and quantum register means that you have a mass parallel features of quantum informatics, like it is shown here in case of uh, n qubits. And uh, similar, like uh, uh, classical informatics, we can define uh, different uh, quantum gates, like uh, phase shift gate or rotation gate. And the content of my paper was the uh, comparison between classical and uh, quantum uh, probability theory. In, in uh, quantum probability theories, uh, sometimes uh, uh, called uh, wave uh, probabilities. So, if you compare the classical probabilities rules with uh, quantum oriented or quantum defined uh, uh, wave functions, so the difference is. In intersection, uh, Apko is a, a classical rule with only minds, and due to uh, features of cosine functions, we have a, a positive and also negative uh, intersection of uh, two qubits. And uh, in my paper, I try try to uh, interpret what does it mean this situation and. It, uh, I defined uh, analytical thinking. It is the classical probability where we can extract uh, redundant information and synthetic thinking in case uh, we have a negative uh, intersection of probabilities, which yields into, into demand for new knowledge. I applied it in circuits. This was defined by Professor Pjarsson Oček many years ago in analogy with uh, uh, electrical circuits that we have uh, in information uh, systems uh, uh, flow of data in bits per second, yeah. information contents in chow per bit. And Professor Pjarsson Oček also 
and Professor Moss defined many years ago information power as multiplication of information flow and information content. I have uh, extended this theory into quantum system theory, and I define uh, wave information flow and wave information content, and also wave uh, information power. And if you look at these equations, so some information powers can have a similar value. And in this theory, it appears into resonance of two complex values that some combination can disappear or can be eliminated, and some combinations can be multiplied, and it can explain some appearance of emergent states or some emergent behavior of soft systems. In the conclusions, I try to describe this theory for two events, but it can be extended to more events. I think that information power is a very good measure of knowledge content and can be used for modeling soft systems. And also in literature, this theory is used to model some altruistic behavior in uh, human systems and so on. More information is in my uh, monograph that was published on the year information physics, but I try to extend these theories also and define them for some linear and some other, other cases. Thank you for your attention. Oh, thank you. So the next, the next presentation will cover the results of the test part. Okay, sorry for the complication. This was not the best start. Uh, so uh, my name is Tomasz Hukman. I'm here instead of Alan Burger to present the results of uh, the test part. We will start with the results overview. Uh, so uh, they consist from papers, prototypes, and functional samples. Uh, let's start with the two journal papers from Barat uh, Alikovac, which was focused on motion modeling of five axis delta robot, which is located in TEDVET and uh, Martin Ron's uh, publication for parameter continuity in time varying Gauss Markov models. Uh, then we have also two conference papers from Varun Burde uh, for automatic workspace calibration using homography for pick and play servo. And uh, second, uh, second conference paper was from Paul Hrabitsky, description and evaluation from production goals. Uh, we also submitted uh, one journal paper, which I will present later in this section. Uh, then our results consist of prototypes. There are three prototypes which are proposed on technology transfer now. Uh, these are 5G IoT devices uh, developed in our uh, embedded lab. There is a technology transfer with uh, three connections at Emobile, Chip Republic. Uh, second device is for measurement and optimization of electricity consumption in, in uh, collaboration with Twix Connections and Pilsen uh, and Kuka. And uh, functional examples, there are seven, seven functional examples uh, which are uh, connected to our rig infrastructure uh, from Rig and also to our, uh, to our industrial partners. On this slide, there is a short overview of uh, some of those functional examples and prototypes. Uh, as you can see, uh, there are, uh, I would say, wide area of results uh, in the areas from certainly from additive manufacturing, robotics, planning, uh, for example, virtual commissioning of a plant, uh, and uh, others. So now I will present uh, my contribution. I'm focusing on uh, robotic multi axis 3D printing. Uh, this is part of my PhD study. 
Uh, what are the challenges? Basically, we are using industrial robot with versus positioner uh, for those ones who are in that bed, you probably saw this workplace. And uh, challenges uh, are uh, to maintain uh, printing accuracy and consistency and uh, have a good synchronization between the robot and external motion. And uh, to, let's say, overcome these challenges, uh, we utilize the digital twin of the workplace, and the real workplace is equipped with laser tracker, which provides uh, understanding of the processes uh, in printing. Uh, methodology uh, consists of uh, multiple calibration procedures. And uh, as I said before, we are more focused on practical implementations than theoretical. So our expectations are that the calibration processes and the methodology will be automated and easy to use for users. For example, uh, a lot of you have uh, some experience with 3D printing with uh, some, uh, let's say, blue sharp 3D printers, but printing it with robot, um, it's, uh, I would say, uh, more complex and needs to, uh, let's say, have some expertise in it. And our uh, expectation is to provide the system for companies that they will use it like a normal 3D printer. Here is a uh, short demonstration video of uh, the actual results. This is the workplace uh, and its scheme. And uh, this is like procedure which uh, will be, let's say, uh, used in a company. So that means that operator creates a setup of the workplace. It has an equal kinematic as the workstation in the uh, He loads tools and printing pads, and we start into the calibration process. That means that uh, we equip the robot with a reflector, and uh, what we are doing is that the robot is going to some position, and from the, uh, like, locks the position from forward kinematics, and also from the laser tracker. And based on this knowledge, we are then uh, able to uh, precisely uh, define the transaction between the robot and the positioner. And all the codes for the calibration are uh, automatically generated by the operator. So that means that the operator uh, doesn't, uh, let's say, maybe understand the process. He just create the file, put it to the robot, and run it. Uh, here we are going to the section where there is a calibration of the positioner and of the printing pad. And based on the log data from those two calibration processes, we are capable to evaluate the robot accuracy in static, let's say, way, and uh, set up the conjunction between the robot and the positioner. Now we transfer to the uh, extrusion calibration process, which is, I would say, more interesting uh, because uh, Probably uh, those who had some experience with 3D printing, it's sometimes tricky to set up the parameters correctly. Uh, we are talking about velocity, uh, layer height, uh, material flow, and temperatures. And our process uh, was is to create and print nine collaboration artifacts. Uh, and these have uh, various uh, process parameters. During this process, we can also um, evaluate machine accuracy in the continuous movement of the robot, which is also necessary information, because for example, based on this, you can set up the, what is the, your minimal layer height. And um, after this evaluation, uh, these uh, calibration artifacts are precisely measured, also in automated way, you will see uh, this process now. And the key, uh, Information is that uh, when we print the caliber, when we print the, uh, the artifacts and measure them precisely, we can get a heat map of the, let's say, process parameters where we can print accurately and where we, where we lose the accuracy. And it is, uh, let's say, somehow uh, physical limitations of the material and the workplace. Uh, the evaluation will be, will be you can see it uh, in a second. Now, okay, so the uh, blue area is where we can print precisely, and uh, the other areas are where we lose the accuracy. Based on this analysis, we can provide some extrapolation of the data for different temperatures and the different settings. 
And this is the, I would say, uh, key information for our industrial partners. This is uh, how operator will operate the system in real life. So here we have some part, it is a tool, and uh, it creates the process which is necessary to generate the code for the robot and uses our and also the calibration process in Bitcoin. So uh, what this brought is that normally this operation was, uh, let's say, multiple hours. It could be more than two hours. And now uh, we are talking about seven minutes. Uh, here uh, we have the comparison of the digital twin simulation and the real workplace. Uh, this is really an uh, important tool. You can verify collisions. You can verify also uh, singularities of the system and so on. And thanks to the fact that we have uh, the digital twin and real workstation uh, really precisely calibrated, we can now uh, see that um, it uh, behaves uh, exactly. So this is the printed part. We can also do some reverse engineering on multiple, uh, multiple, let's say, complex geometries and evaluate also the accuracy of the parts. Uh, so I basically uh, said uh, what is the, what are the advantages and uh, usage in, in industry. And uh, these are some prototypes which are printed uh, by this technology. Uh, yeah, so that's everything on me. Questions, comments? So maybe I can ask, uh, what is the, the advantage of such robotic as compared to process? So the uh, advantages are that uh, we can print, for example, without supports. Uh, there is a material which is necessary to, uh, let's say, uh, when you want to build some overhangs, for example, in this uh, first uh, picture, there is an overhang structure which uh, couldn't be printed on a normal 3D printer. Otherwise, you would need a lot of support. And that means you need to post-process it, which is, uh, let's say, a few hours after the print. And we can print uh, also, uh, as it is called, multi-axis. Uh, this is the second part. So we can print two. And its uh, layer height differs. When we slide the tool, uh, sorry, when we slide the tube, uh, like uh, the areas uh, differ in the material flow, like they, during the during the printing. So this is also not possible to print with, uh, let's say, normal technologies. And uh, we can also print uh, larger objects. Uh, we are talking about diameter of uh, 600 millimeters, and the height is up to one meter. Thank you. So now I'm pleased to invite uh, Dr. Tilman Becker uh, to present the results of the RECAP project. So, good morning, everyone. Um, let me run you through um, some information about um, the Rike platform and concentrate on some facets of distributed manufacturing in Rike. Um, as you might know, Rike is the platform for research and innovation um, to build a center on advanced industrial production. It comes in uh, the initial um, section of the Rike project, actually two projects, one by the EU supported by a national Czech project, uh, setting up this Recape Center as an international multi-site uh, center um, that supports and connects test beds, not just the one in Prague, but also um, the corresponding one in Renault and at our partner sites in Saarbrücken and in Kaiserslautern. And we're adding partners in Dresden, for example, and in Ostrava uh, while we go. Um, as a platform, it's people. So there are the tenure trackers and their teams, and some of them have been will be presenting here. Um, there is the testbed team. Actually, it's teams because we have uh, the partnering infrastructure in Brno and in Germany. Um, and you've see, just seen Pomash Jochmann's presentation uh, giving you an example of the kind of work that's performed there. I will go into another one uh, shortly. Um, and then last but not least, it's the very big infrastructure that's set up. 
uh, down here, but also Iberno and existing infrastructure at other partners. Um, and it's also a platform to attract new projects. That's really the core of the center and the platform. Uh, we've been successful already in being a member of the testing and experimentation facility for manufacturing and European project. Um, quite prestigious and well financed, where um, the partners in the Rikay platform are the Czech Note. Um, and there are also uh, digital innovation hubs locally in Prague and in Brno, and also with the German partners like AI Rice, for example. So, um, speaking about uh, the tenure trackers, Tomasz Mikulov, Torsten Sattler, uh, Martin Suda, Mikolaj Janota, and their produced research in their growing groups. Um, an excerpt of the list from last year is here, and you've seen some of their work, so I will not um, concentrate more on this. Um, the test bed itself, you might have seen it, um, it extends over two floors, um, which is fairly large. And in particular, and maybe one should say this explicitly, when compared to what other institutions have, this is really big. This is something to play with and um, to work with. Um, sometimes people call what they have a test bed, then it's 100 square meters uh, with five robots. And we're working on a very different scale here, which is great for the many experiments that can be done, lots of academic work, but also for communicating with industry. The hardware we use, as far as it's, it is not self-developed, is really industrial-type hardware, and uh, it immediately transfers in the mind of industry to what they're doing. It's a very short step to see that something that works here can be applied in, in factories. Uh, as I said, it's a growing network. It's the core partners Park Renault, but it's Ostrava, it's Dresden, and it's the uh, German partners uh, DFPI and Zima in um, Saarbrücken and Kaiserslautern. And in Kaiserslautern, specifically the Smart Factory KL, which is associated with DFPI, but actually an independent body, having some almost 50 industrial members paying membership fees. So what I want to show is one of the examples that the RICA project is working on um, to show how integration across sites can work and explore what the challenges are. It's motivated by a running industrial project. Um, it's about disassembling battery cases, large um, BMW i3 style um, battery cases, um, disassembling them, looking at the components and see whether they can have a second life as parts of say a home storage device. So um, it's been demonstrated in a very condensed fashion with models at the Brno Engineering Fair. Lots of people have seen this, a very nice um, exhibit uh, not as popular as the free beer, of course, but you can't be that. Um, and it's a perfect example and proving ground for this approach of having a digital twin for production. A uh, digital twin is just a fancy word to have all the information somewhere, and there are many ways of doing this, but it shows in this uh, full life cycle um, use case here, if you disassemble the battery and take one battery block out of it and put it into a new product, a home storage device, it's very much unclear how the digital twin of this new storage device can benefit from the digital information that's in the car battery. Sounds trivial, it should be, but believe me, it isn't. Um, so this product and all the resource and process descriptions um, are what we're working on. We try to make them independent of technology because there are many, including industrial partners, who have their own who try to get you into a vendor lock-in, that you only buy their services. Companies like Apple are really good at this, and others try to uh, copy this. Um, so we reduce it to well-defined interfaces that we can provide adapters for, and that's an art in itself. And that gives us the um, position to be ready to integrate various different systems um, into this, in particular in production planning and, and uh, machine execution systems. As I've mentioned, this is a very nice example of uh, covering the full product life cycle. And um, we are showing all of the uh, production flexibility, all of the independent projects and objects uh, here. Um, and that leads us um, to being able to chop it up into different manufacturing services. And combining those uh, is something that uh, people are betting on to be able to provide manufacturing as a service, as an offering, by being able to put together different services from different service providers 
um, to um, eventually build a car on your own by simply getting the services from everywhere. Far in the future, then we'll be able to do this, but we're working on this way. <laughs> so in this way, this is really a forward looking uh, thing. And um, to set this up, we're working on an integration architecture that really puts all of these things into their modular building blocks, <clears throat> providing an integration platform with these open interfaces that can be uh, addressed uh, through translators by many other different approaches. Um, Grouping these things into models allows us to see them as independent agents and use all of the multi-agent uh, system theories that is uh, existing already. That's a classical AI topic. Um, and um, that modularization is obviously a way to be able to distribute manufacturing over multiple sites, understand how things that are done independently at different places can work together. And uh, we're integrating this currently with manufacturing execution systems, for example, in collaboration with T-Mobile. So this is really on its path um, to implementations. And I will just close with mentioning um, some of the challenges. Uh, obviously, it's integrating with other existing approaches to exactly this, other um, multi-agent systems, but also big platforms that are currently being developed, for example, in Germany, the buses under the BAS6 uh, nomina, uh, nomina platform. Um, another big problem in the digital twins is knowledge representation. If we have the digital data, the format is really important. So things like having the right ontological structures, being able to deal with ontology matching, those are really interesting things. And then as far as um, execution and planning is concerned, we're running exactly into these complexity problems. So any input we can have there would be a great way of, of, of joining forces. So thank you very much. <laughs>